Well, good morning. It's a little better, just a little better. Good morning. Much better, much better. Such a pleasure to be here with you um, and to share some of my observations about the, uh, the future. But look, we're all futurists uh, in this regard. The future is moving far too quickly for any of us to take on that moniker and carry it alone. So let's make this a collaborative effort as we think through what that future will, will look like. Bob had a great quote this morning, which I took down rapidly as I, he had a lot of great quotes actually, but this one just sort of stuck in my mind. It is so difficult to let go of the past, especially when the past has gotten us to whatever state of success we're currently in. So we always reside in those efforts of the past, and that's why they're so difficult to let go of. Part of my job here today is not to convince you to let go of the past by any means, but to help you better understand how to build the future and how to build it in the absence of certainty, how to build it in time frames that sometimes require that we make decisions far too quickly, much more quickly than we are comfortable with. So I, I want to get started by asking you some simple questions to kind of see what your thoughts are, wh wh how you look at the, at the future, and how grounded you might be in the past. Someone once said that all the great things that have been invented have already been invented. Does anyone in this room believe that statement? Does anyone believe that all the great things have already been invented? There's nothing left to invent yet? Anybody? Of course not. None of us believe it. But what if I were to tell you that while we don't believe it, you and I, we still behave it. We behave as though all the great things have already been created. We're the pinnacle of civilization. No one can do better than we have. Why would we behave that way if we don't want to believe this? If I were to ask you to give me one word, just one word, not a sentence, not a phrase, not a paragraph, I don't want a thesis on this, just one word that answers this question. What's gotten us to where we are today? As a civilization, as a global community, what would that one word be? What word comes to mind when you think of this? Shut them out. What words come to mind? Innovation, Innovation of course. What else? Ingenuity. Imagination. Oh, oh, great words, right? These are the words that we want to teach our kids, right? Be innovative, be imaginative, be creative. What if I were to also ask you, same word now, same word, also ask you to give me a word that not only answers the first question, but the second question. How will we overcome all the challenges, these great obstacles that, that, that face us from, from climate change to the tremendous disruptive nature of the social political environment, the economic challenges that face us? agricultural challenges that face us, the challenges that you're talking about here for rural America, what would that word be? Is it the same word? Is there a different word that comes to mind? Unlearning. I love that. I love that. Unlearning. What else? Fear. I often hear that. People often say fear. A great driver, a great motivator, probably a great innovator at the end of the day. What else? Collaboration. What if I were to tell you that all of these words, every word that you've come up with so far, actually rests on a much deeper foundation, on footings that, that go down much further than any of these superficial, more symptomatic sort of words that we're using here. The word in my mind, and it has been the word that has most driven progress over the entirety of mankind's existence, is connections. And when I think about connections in the context of the RFI and what you're doing, some very important important aspect of connections comes up in my mind, and it is the connections that lead to community. You see, much of what I hear when I hear you talk about your mission and your objectives and your ambitions is this intent to take the core values that reside in rural America, values around family, strong values around family, values around work ethic. Crystal was just talking about the work that she was, she was raised with. To take these and to somehow reinforce their validity in modern society and in the future. And you know what? They will be more valid, more important, more meaningful, more critical going forward than they have been looking backwards. So what if I were to tell you that what you're doing here is building a sense of community that we, in fact, will be able to export to the entirety of the world? You know, it's still the case. As amazing as this sounds, there are seven billion people on this earth. Only two billion of them have, in, even in the most generous estimate, 
access to the internet. A quarter to half of them, depending on who you listen to, still don't have access to basic telecommunications. When we talk about rural, we're talking about a global issue that we need to impact. And part of what you're doing is building a future that will impact that global rural challenge. And that's what excites me. That's what excites me about what you're doing. But, but it, is, it is not going to happen easily. It's not going to happen easily. Chuck, you know that. Um, there's a challenge here uh, for you. And the challenge is partly packaging, uh, partly messaging, and partly just rolling up your sleeves and getting it done. But you know what? It's not a new challenge. Does anyone recognize this photograph? Anyone know what this place is? Anyone traveled to, uh, to Turkey? Yeah. Ephesus, yes. The ancient city of, of it's now called Kusadasi, the ancient city of Ephesus. And what you see here, Ephesus is one of the greatest excavations uh, of ancient civilization that exists today. When you go to Ephesus, uh, it's an enormous city. You, you walk down the, the chariot-grooved streets that the chariots rode through and the, the mosaic-tiled sidewalks, and you see the condominiums where the lawyers and the doctors lived. And it's, it's an amazing glimpse of civilization. And it says to you, things haven't changed that much for some small segment of society. In the middle of the city, you see this very imposing structure here. It's the, the Library of Celsus. The Library of Celsus was where all the, the knowledge of the day was stored in, in these you know, enormous scrolls, you can imagine. And as you look at the structure, it's quite fascinating. It was actually built like a thermos. It had two walls to keep the contents very safe. Smart people, right? These were brilliant people. They may have lived thousands of years ago, but I think they had the same capacity to think ingenious thoughts as we do today, if not the technology that we have. In some ways, I think we may have lost some of the capacity to think as brilliantly as, as, they, as they did because of our technology. But as you walk down the street to see the Library of Celsus, there's an odd reminder of community that was architected into the very fiber of this civilization. So as your guide walks you down the street and you see the imposing city square where the library and the town offices were, a little further down the street there's the large amphitheater built out of the the rock and the cliff. He sits you down in this very odd sort of temple-like structure. And you don't know exactly what this is when you first look at it, but it becomes kind of obvious to you after a while if you Let's see if I can right in the middle of that, there is this little temple. You can see that long column that's kind of sticking out there. And your tour guide sits you down and explains to you what a tremendous civilization this was. And then he asks you, so where do you think you're sitting now? What building do you think this is? What temple do you think this is? And you imagine it must have been maybe a, 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 some sort of a church or something, maybe, where everyone gathered on a daily basis. And, and in fact, people did gather there on a daily basis. And it dawns on you as the discussion turns to the topic of running water. That in fact, because it's a very comfortable seat. Can you see the little seats there? It's actually quite comfortable when you sit down there. But what you're sitting in is the communal potty, right? The toilet. And it strikes you as rather odd that it's directly opposite from the library. And this flight of fancy sort of took me over. Nice Sunday, sun is shining. I go to the library, check out a scroll, go across the street, sit down for a while. And you think how crude that they would do this in the open right next to the city center. And then you realize, you realize, there's nothing crude about this. This was architecture creating community. How do we get an audience of everyone in the city every day? Well, we make sure that they gather in the center of town because they all have to use one. If not the library, they certainly have to use the potty. Community is not new. This is my point, it's not new. Community is what we're driven to whenever we innovate. You know, Franz's point about, uh, and it's a wonderful point, about the notion of diversity and its contribution to innovation is great, but let me take it one step further for you. Community is not just a facilitator. Community is what we're drawn to. We're drawn to it whenever a crisis occurs. We're drawn to it for personal growth. We're drawn to it for very selfish reasons. But we're also drawn to it because it is a fundamental construct that as human beings, 
creates gravity. And this is part of what you're developing, an architecture for community, rural community. But the urbanization of the world, in my mind, has been a bit of an anomaly. See, we urbanized because we had to. We urbanized because the only way we could make connections without technology was to be in the same place at the same time. Well, guess what? We don't have to do that anymore. The urbanization of the world was an anomaly in the overall scheme of things, right? On the glacial time frame, it is an anomaly. We're driven to community, not to place, but to people. So if connections are really that radical, as radical as I say they are, what are the numbers? So let's talk about the numbers for a minute. Because what we're building here is not just a community of people. We're building a community of things. And that is partly why I'm so fascinated about what the future is going to look like. If you look at this chart, what it's showing you is that since 1800, which was the, the first year, that's when we hit 1 billion people globally. The population of the world hit 1 billion people in, in 1800. From that point forward, the number of connections has increased, right? The number of people in the world has increased, the number of machines in the world has increased, computers that we interface with. But what's increased most, that blue wedge, are the machine-to-machine -machine connections, machines that are talking to each other. And I'll show you ample example of, of this as we move forward. This is nothing new in Agra, by the way. The biggest revolution in Agra has been, right, the mechanization, computerization, and the automation of what happens in the farm. But there's, there's a lot more going on here than just that kind of simplistic machine-to-machine -machine communication. In fact, when I wrote this last book, Cloud Surfing, the research we did at Delphi Group said that we would have somewhere in the order of about 100 billion interconnected devices globally. 100 billion interconnected devices globally by the year 2020. The book's not that old. Six months after the book was, was written, I was at an event with the VP of, of Strategy for Future Development at at and and he looked at my number. We were talking about the Internet of Things. Some folks from Cisco that I've worked with for a long time were also there. And they both said, Tom, that's a really small number. We, we think it's going to be much larger than that. I said, well, how large do you think it's going to be? They said, we're looking at about a trillion interconnected devices. I said, how'd you get that number one trillion? Why, why that big? You know, ten times what we were looking at. How, how could that be? So we actually did the research. We looked at the number of sensors every individual would have, and we extrapolated from that the progress of technology as it does get globalized, and more and more people have access to these devices like smartphones, and what that means in terms of total sensors available to us and the number that we'd be able to talk to each other, and we come up with a trillion. About two months ago, I was at another event. Uh, sponsored by a large group of manufacturers. And they said, you know what, that trillion dollar number, that, 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 that trillion uh, device number, outdated, Tom. We're looking at 2.8 trillion. So in the course of about a year, we've gone from 100 billion to almost 3 trillion interconnected devices by 2020. And you know this number's gonna grow. You know this number's gonna grow. You know what's fascinating? Human brain has on the order of about 100 billion neurons has a lot more connections than that because the neurons can have synapses in different states of energy, but about 100 billion total neurons. What we're building with these machine-to-machine -machine connections is a new form of intelligence. An intelligence that will manifest itself in terms of building the future as an active contributor. It will, it will actually be a partner with us, a collaborator, an active contributor to building that future. That's not the kind of Ray Kurzweil intelligence. I'm not talking about something that will think like a human being or will have consciousness. I don't have to go anywhere near that. Far, far from that, I'm just talking about machines being able to talk to each other in such a way that they mitigate so many of the issues that today require human intervention. Ultimately, the point where these machines can't even innovate for us. What does that kind of a world begin to look like? Tough to imagine. Uh, and it, and, it, and it, it makes my hundred billion dollar number seem paltry in comparison. Even the three trillion is, pro is paltry. I, I, I think it, whatever we look at, trying to sit here at the, at the shoreline while the tsunami comes in and, and sort of rationalize it scientifically makes no sense. It doesn't matter. I mean, you know, we go from megabytes to, to, to gigabytes to terabytes to petabytes to exabytes. I mean, what the hell comes next? Who cares? Does it matter? It doesn't. The, the numbers here are meaningless. What does matter is that the fundamental behavior of people is going to change radically 
because this interconnectivity is going to create a world that we simply have no precedence for, none. But what will remain is the compelling need to create community. And it will actually be amplified, I think, because of this. So how do you serve the tsunami? Well, if you were to think about what the world looks like today to you, if you were to kind of picture it in your mind's eye, most of you would probably come up with a picture like this, the blue marble, right, floating in the darkness of outer space that, that sort of become the, the icon for many generations of what the world looks like. Sort of the, the seed that was planted that really began the sustainability and the ecological movement that we're all part of today. About seven years ago, a friend was visiting me from India. I was building an innovation center in India, and, and a friend came to visit me. He said, he said to me, Tom, as we were meeting in Boston, he said, Tom, when you think of the world, what image comes to mind? My image was not this progressive. I thought about it for a few seconds, and the image I came up with was the image of the world that hung in my grade school classroom, right? The Mercator projection map. Many of you might recognize this and have familiarity with it. Where this image says Russia, you want to guess what my image said? What do you think? Yell it out. USSR. Stuck in time. A lens that was, that was so stuck in time that I, I couldn't move my view of the world. And I'm supposed to be a futurist. I'm supposed to think about the future all the time, but I'm still stuck in the past. Part of my mind is just wired to look at the world in this way. Look at the last two centuries, not including this one, the last two centuries. And if you think about the major trends that have really defined progress, it has been the movement first of people, then the movement of things, goods, then the movement of information, and today it is the movement of work. Place does not matter. Resume does not matter. Education, I apologize, does not matter. Because if I want a solution, I don't really care what your education or your resume is. If you've got a solution, I'll pay for it. And it's being done. You've got global exchanges like, uh, like uh, 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 Nine Sigma and Innocentive that are literally allowing the population of the world, at least those that have access to the internet, to be solvers in enormously complex scientific problems and challenges without regard to what their resume says or where they got their education. This is the world your kids and my kids will compete in. Do the rules change? Yeah, just a bit, just a bit. How many of you, how many of you, when you were 10, 11, 12 years old, said, you know what, I'm going to grow up and I want to define the future of rural America. Anybody? Who said that? Chuck, you said that? Thought it maybe? Somewhere in the back of your mind? What did you want to be when you were 10 or 11 or 12? What did you want to be? Someone tell me. A cowboy. A cowboy. Absolutely. Makes perfect sense. I can tell by the shoes. Yeah. I wish I had worn my cowboy boots out here. I wasn't thinking. What else did you want to be? A nurse, exactly. Crystal, what do you want to be? A singer. A singer. I wanted to be an engineer. I wanted to be a civil engineer. And I had a very specific reason for this. My dad was a big time engineer. He was electrical, mechanical. He built a lot of early computer parts. Brilliant guy. Brilliant, brilliant guy. So I had the bug. I wanted to be an engineer. I was a real geek, by the way, as a kid. I was geek long before it was chic to be geek. Long before that was chic to be geek. And, uh, and when I, it came time to apply to, to schools, back then you applied to one or two schools. You didn't apply to 10 or 12 schools the way kids do today. I applied. One of the schools I applied to was my dad's alma mater, uh, just on a lot, just for, for, for kicks. And I got accepted. I, <laughs> to this day, I don't know what went wrong. I got accepted. And just so you understand the background here, I've, I've, I'm working on my 10th book. That's more books than I read through my entire academic career, okay? So just so we get all pretenses aside. 
I was so tickled to get this letter of acceptance. I, I, I can remember it is like a videotape in HD quality. I, just, I can remember going to my dad and saying, Dad, look at this. I got accepted to your alma mater, and I'm going to be an engineer. And he said, that's great. That's awesome, Tom. What kind of engineer do you want to be? I said, Dad, I, I've got this. I've got this. I want to be a civil engineer, and I want to build a bridge. He said, really? I said, yeah, yeah, a big bridge. And, and I want it to be a magnificent bridge, and I want it to have the name Kalopolis on it, so it would have to be a really big bridge, you know, to fit all those letters on it. What do you think? And he, he looked at me with um, that compassion only, only a father can, can possess, and, and he, said, uh, he said, Tom, it would be a beautiful bridge. I just wouldn't want to cross it. <laughs> God's honest truth. God's honest truth. Um, so with, with that encouragement, off I went to engineering school. And for, well, my daughter is now going to school as well. She's a freshman at the same school, oddly enough. Big school, big Northeastern, uh, Northeast school. And, and um, it was the, one of the orientation programs, I guess, where the dean of the, of the engineering school got up to give us sort of a lesson on what it meant to be engineers. And at one point during this diatribe, he was just you know, going absolutely crazy about how engineers look at the world. He grabbed, he grabbed a chair that happened to be there, kind of like this one. He held it up high, and he said, what do you see? As engineers, what do you see when I hold this up? I remember my friend Sal was sitting next to me. And I said, Sal, it's a chair, right? It's not a trick. <laughs> Sal said, yeah, that's a chair. That's what I see. And he went on, he went on, he said, he said, as engineers, you don't look at the world the way other people do. You see, as an engineer, you don't see a chair when you look at this. In fact, when you look at this, what you see are four vectors of force. And I thought, <laughs> I'm not seeing it. It, it, took me, it took me a good, I don't know, maybe 30 years to figure out what this guy was saying. The point he was trying to make was, we all develop this view that we apply to the world. And it is this view that gives us value. This view is built in the past. It's built on the shoulders of the past. And that lens that permits us to add value, that, that view that we bring to our careers, to our professions, to our lives in general, you know, it gets cloudy over time. And suddenly, what we saw that added value no longer seems to work. And that's frustrating. Why is it frustrating? Especially when you look at it through generational lenses. I've got a 14-year-old, in addition to my 18-year-old who's, who's in college now, Man, he, he, he is my mentor. He is my mentor. He teaches me things about how kids look at the world that I, I never would have imagined. When I ask him, and I do a lot of K through 12 work, when I ask kids his age what their worldview is, this is what they see. The overwhelming response is Google Earth. That's their view of the world. No borders, no limitations. Community, wherever I need it, however I need it, doesn't matter. They could be Saudi Arabian, they could be Canadian, they could be from Singapore, it just doesn't matter. I just, I need these people to be able to game, to play. You want to know what the future will look like? You don't need me up here to tell you this. You've got this at home. Look at how your kids play. That's how they'll work. Look at how they play today. Everything that annoys you about the way they game is how they will work in 10 to 20 years. That is tomorrow's workforce. Constantly connected. Always on. Adam looks like NORAD. I mean, he can't have enough screens in his room. And, and, and my, my, um, my daughter, Mia, God bless her, she's so connected she doesn't realize it. She had her first boyfriend at 16, Ryan. Great kid. What a wonderful kid. It's, it's kind of, you know, first boyfriend every dad wants for his daughter. Only problem was Ryan moved in with us. He lived with us for an entire year, the first year of their relationship. He lived in our house on Skype. It didn't matter what time of day or night I'd walk into Mia's room. The laptop would be open. There would be Ryan. Hey, Ryan. Hey, Mr. K. Kid lived with us for a whole year. I, at one point, I said to Mia, I said, you know, Mia, at 16, I had my first girlfriend, too. 
Do you realize we would go for not just hours, but sometimes days without seeing each other? She was aghast. How? How could one maintain a relationship without seeing each other for days? How is that possible? Because for her, it's not. Mia does not know what it means to be alone. She doesn't get that. She needs that constant connection. You ask why kids collaborate more? It's not because the world's challenges are greater, they are. It's because they know no other way. They're born into this. We weren't. Anybody have one of these still? Right? Aren't they cool? I would so trade my 5S for the right, you know, turn of the century typewriter. This is a magnificent machine. This is just a little black box. I have no idea what the hell's going on in here. This, I can see it all. So I collect these. I've got about a half dozen of them. I buy them, I clean them up. My, my son and I are actually building a version of one of these. We, we, we got an old Smith Corona. We're actually building one that, will, that will, has a circuitry in it that will be USB enabled. So you can actually plug it in as a keyboard with USB input to your computer, right? I'll be, I'll be lugging this around with me to, to, to show folks. It's a, a great idea, completely useless, but just a great idea. Um, so I collect these, and my kids as they were growing up would have all kinds of comments, as did my nieces and nephews. They, they would say things like, um, gee, how, how did you, you know, correct stuff when you made a mistake? And you'd show them you know, how you'd use white out. Wow, that's really cool, Uncle Tom. But, but how did you, like, you made a big mistake. Like, you know, how did you cut and paste? No, the cut and paste is what you would do. You would actually cut and you would paste. It's like, whoa, really? That is so neat. And then at one point, my, my nephew Vernon said to me one day, he must have been, I don't know, maybe seven or eight years old, he said, um, Uncle Tom, how did you think using this? How did you think? Let, let, let that sink in for a minute. What the hell does that mean? Because you don't think using a typewriter, right? The thinking doesn't happen in the machine, but for these kids, the lines are blurred. Where does the thinking happen? Does it happen in here? Does it happen in here? Does it happen in the community? Where, where, there's no, no boundaries to the thinking. I teach undergrad and grad classes. You know, my undergrad students, 80 to 90 percent of them think we should abolish the patent and trademark system. Abolish it. It is a complete fiasco, a travesty when it comes to innovation. My grad students, they're pretty well split, split down the middle, 50-50. We have these raging debates about our patents useful anymore. And, and their opinion is, hey, things are moving too fast. You don't need patents. You just don't need them. They, they stifle innovation. And how can you argue with them when you have folks, you know, Microsoft, Google, Apple, spending more to defend and protect patents than they are on R&D. There's something not right with that equation. Right? You have patent trolls that are making it impossible for small, medium-sized business to, to, uh, uh, to bring product and, 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 and ideas to market. These kids grow up in a very different way. They grow up constantly connected to each other and to their devices. The devices become part of the community. Don't believe me? What is she doing? What's this little girl doing? Anybody? She's not reading the magazine. She's doing what? She's trying to interact with the magazine. To her, a magazine is a defective iPad. And the proof, don't you love this? Yeah, exactly. The proof is that last thing where she's got her finger pushing on her thigh. You see the finger? Making the dimple in the thigh, brilliant girl. There you go. Finger is working. Magazine's broken. <laughs> right? It's not technology. Technology is what you don't grow up with. For me, this is technology. It's cool. This is not technology to them. This is part of their community. This is like you know. This is the equivalent of of having um, a conversation with a person, but in this case it happens to be a device. It doesn't make any difference to her. The notion of what community is will change in ways that are almost impossible. They are impossible for us to fathom right now. My point is that they will change. That these devices, this intelligence we're creating will become part of this new community. There's goodness to that, but it's also, for some of us, not a great thing. Because we're not going to move that fast. Some of us will be left behind. It's going to happen. 
What is the single greatest impediment to great change? What is it? It's generational. You gotta wait for a whole bunch of folks to die off before the change really happens. Let the past inform the future, but don't let it define the future. Don't let the limits of the past convince you that they will define the limits of the future. They don't, they don't. And, and yet we, we so desperately want to believe over and over again that we figured that out. Remember this guy, Maxwell Smart? Oh, some of you are way too young. What's going on? I, you, hold on, okay. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna define the demographic of this room in less than five seconds. You ready for this? Where's my wallet? Hold on, hold on. I've got something in my wallet here, which I showed my daughter a few days ago. She got such a kick out of this. You ready? I want you to tell me what this is when I hold it up. Ready? First one to shout it out gets it. It's for a record player. What does it do to the record player? It keeps the record on the record player. What's a record? What's a record player? Why do you need this thing? Um, I brought one to my daughter. She, she looked at it and she said, what? what are these things? Are they like mini Frisbees? Uh, and she's 18. She's 18, right? They're the things you used to put in 45 RPM records. because the hole, Why was the hole so big in the 45 RPM record, by the way? Couldn't they make small? I, don't, I never got that. You would put these in the 45 RPM record because the hole was too big. Half of you have no idea what the hell I'm talking about. See this? I mean, this, that's pathetic. I'm not that old. I'm not. I'm not. When, when the first Motorola cell phones came out, um, there were predictions about how many of them would, would, would exist, right? And we were so off in the predictions, it's just, it's, it's frightening. It's frightening how wrong we were. Anybody want to guess when the first Motorola brick came out in the early 1980s, what did the pundits predict would be the total number of cell phones in use by the turn of the century? Total number, not just Motorola, all cell phones in use globally by the turn of the century. What do you think? 10,000, a little higher than that. A million? The consensus was about 10 million. The top of the bell was about 10 million. There was an out, a few outliers, a few outliers that were at 100 million, 100 million. But most folks thought that 10, 10 million dollar number was yeah, just about right, just about right. How many cell phones are enabled globally today? As I stand here, how many cell phones? More. It's more. 5.6 billion cell phone numbers enabled globally. 5.6 billion. You can fact check me all you want. It's probably higher than that. I'm sorry. It's probably closer to six at this point. Now, they're not all for human beings. Some of them are for machines. The vast majority are for human beings. We don't all have one cell phone. How many have more than one cell phone? More than one smartphone, right? So if you have two or three numbers, maybe. Okay, but hold on. 100 billion to, let's say rough numbers, 100 million to 5 billion. This is not a rounding error. Right? 100 million to 5 billion is not something you can just kind of chalk up to, oh, well, you know, we almost got there, but not quite. That just, it's, it's incredibly inept futurism. Incredibly inept. Why do we get it so wrong? This magazine, Invention of Technology, which I love, my dad gave me a subscription to this when I was, when I was younger. I've kept it going over the years. Um, this issue was actually an issue that I had gotten a couple of years ago. It was sitting on the kitchen table. My daughter Mia saw it, and, and Mia looked at it, and she said, she said I, don't, I don't get why this is funny. You know, shouldn't he just be using his cell phone? <laughs> we didn't have cell phones. We didn't know what they would look like, Mia. We thought this is, and by the way, look, it's a rotary dial shoe. It's not, it's not even a push button. <laughs> this is what we thought we'd be using, you know? I will show you how incredibly inept we really are. And this is frightening. This is frightening. Tell me if you remember these commercials when you, when you see them. They were run. I'm going to ask you to tell me Have you ever when. borrowed a book? They're so spot thousands on. Thousands of miles away. They're so spot on. AT&T ran these commercials. Across the country. So you're seeing e-books. Without stopping Now you're going to see GPS. You're going to see all the stuff we have today. And it, it looks so like what we have today. What I want you to think about is when was this done? From Tablets, right? iPads. What year carried your medical did AT&T run these commercials? In your wallet. Electronic medical records. All the stuff we have today. This is incredible. Before we stand 
when these were run, we thought this was for the, you know, the, the Jetson kind of future, way out there. Maybe we'll see it in our lifetime, maybe we won't. It was, it was that futuristic. Have you ever watched WebEx, movie you wanted to? Netflix. The minute you wanted I had the future to. nail. What year? And the company what year did these run? AT&T. 1993. Not that long ago. And here's the kicker. AT&T completely understood the future. They knew exactly what the world would look like in 2013. And yet, they didn't bring a single one of these products to market. <laughs> really? How does that happen? How does that happen? How do you get the future so right, and yet not be able to take advantage of it? And there's an answer. And it's the simplest answer that I can give you and the truest. It is not difficult, despite everything you hear, it is not difficult to predict technology. We know exactly what the capacities and the costs, we know the speeds, we know. We can predict this out 10, 20, 30 years. I would claim up to 50 years. There's one thing that we can't project even five years out. It's not technology. What is it? It's behavior. It's behavior. We can't predict the behavior. That's what always takes us by surprise. Always takes us by surprise. So we get obsessed with the technology. We drive ourselves gadget crazy. And if, if God, you know, if you don't believe that, then anybody flying back home? Right? The Bible of invention gone insane. The Sky Mall catalog. <laughs> I defy, I defy any of you to go through this, really go through it cover to cover, and not find at least one thing that you suddenly cannot live without, but yet you didn't even know existed before you opened this up. Right? We can invent, so we do. We, we can invent, so we do. But that doesn't create value. What creates value is behavior. Behavioral change is what creates value. And that's what most fascinates me. Look at how behavior is going to change the way that we shape community. If you want to be part of these communities going forward, there are two things you've got to do. You've got to allow yourself to be disrupted and uncomfortable. And you have to be willing to let go of that which allowed you and gave you license to succeed up until now. Two of the most difficult things in the world to do. Right. Letting go of what got me here? How can I do that? I mean, this, is, this is how I've built my career, my success. Why would I ever let go of that? I do a lot of work with pharma. And it's frightening what's going on in pharma right now. And I put this chart up here. I don't use it in every presentation, but I wanted to use it here because sometimes the obvious is not, is not so obvious. I was on the board of a couple of biotechs back in Boston. As you can well imagine, there's a lot of folks doing research in biotechs. And the first time I saw this chart, I, I didn't think it was right. I couldn't believe it. It just it seemed to me somewhat surreal. What the chart shows is that as investment in R&D, all kinds of research, scientific papers, um, funding is, is increasing, private funding is increasing, foundation funding is increasing. The number of new drugs being brought to market and the cost of each new drug, the number is going down, costs are going up. We're doing something wrong. We're getting to this break point, and whenever you, say, whenever you see two lines intersecting on an XY coordinate system like this, something's not right. Something's not right. We're getting to a break point where we suddenly are no longer able to innovate at a pace that we need to, to deal with the issues, the problems, the challenges that surround us. Now, I'm a big proponent of innovation. My point is not that we can't innovate, it's that we're using the tools of the past to innovate the future, and it's not working. It is not working. It costs too much, it's ineffective, it simply isn't getting the job done. And there are a few reasons why. And this is what you have to deal with. These are the challenges that you have. The first challenge is that of uncertainty. You have to adopt a behavior 
It's supported by technology, but it is behavioral ultimate. You have to adopt a behavior that incorporates the notion of uncertainty into it and allows you to build community and use community as a leverage, as a hedge against uncertainty. What I tell a lot of folks is don't worry about predicting the future. Worry about moving when you see the damn thing. When you see the future, move quickly enough to do something about it. Either to get out of the way so you don't get run over or take advantage of it. So don't predict it, survive it. If you survive it, you're doing pretty good. You'll live another day. That should be your objective. It sounds pretty paltry, doesn't it? Not very ambitious. You know what? It's pretty ambitious. When you look at the rate at which companies come and go, that's a pretty ambitious undertaking. So how do we do that? Okay, so do we get uncertainty, first of all? Do we understand what uncertainty is? Um, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure we get, we get uncertainty. Um, let me give you a framework to think about this. And this framework is, is, is pretty seminal in terms of how you think about the way you build community, how quickly you have to build community, and the way these kids build community. It is the way they build community. It's because of this framework. So over time, as time goes on, the amount of information that we have is going to go up. We have more and more information to make decisions. Uh, we have less and less time within which to make those decisions. So the amount of opportunity goes up, but each opportunity, each opportunity lasts for a shorter and shorter window of time. The uncertainty principle says very simply that as time goes on, opportunity increases and uncertainty increases and the time to react decreases. Simple, straightforward. That is the essential message of any community you build as you move forward, is how do I allow the community to move quickly enough? How do I allow it to move quickly enough to take advantage of the opportunity or to avoid the obstacle? So what's uncertainty? So let me show you how little we get about uncertainty. Give me a board game, a sports game, any kind of game that, that epitomizes, is sort of, is sort of the, the essence of uncertainty. What would you think of? Board game, sports game, that's uncertain. What would it be? Monopoly often comes up, yeah. What else? Life, the board game, yeah. Great board game, yeah. What else, what else do you think of? Chess, chess always comes up, yeah. Games of chance, right? These are not games of uncertainty. There's no game in sports, there's no game in, in casinos are big and beautiful and decorated nicely because the house never loses, right? These are not games of uncertainty. They're games of what? Probability. Uncertainty is what happens when you eliminate the rules. When there are no rules, then there's uncertainty. You want uncertainty, go play chess with a three-year-old. My son Adam, he used to love to do this to me. I taught him how to play chess when he was, when he was young. Oh my, he would, he, yeah, the king would leave the board, go in the other room. I'm not coming back until you give up. He says, Dad, you don't play that way. I'm playing that way. You play whatever way you want. That's the way I'm playing. Right? That's uncertainty. You take the rules away, what do you do? You get pissed off. Wait, what do you mean no rules? There have to be rules. Why? Why do there have to be rules? When you start asking that question, that's when uncertainty really sets in. That's a tedious way to work and live, isn't it? that constant absence of rules. We love rules. We, 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 we want patterns in, in, in life. And then we get stuck in those patterns. And we get held hostage by them. I said you had to be able to live with disruption and discomfort. I'm going to show you what disruption and discomfort look like. I'm going to give you a very visceral sense for what it means to be uncomfortable and to need disruption. You ready for this? Don't take your eyes off the screen. I want you to tell me Think to yourself first before you do. I want you to tell me what direction the girl is spinning. Think, is she spinning clockwise or is she spinning counterclockwise? Raise your hand if she's going clockwise. Let's try to break this down, okay? Raise your hand if she's going counterclockwise. Almost, almost half and half. Now, some of you see her going both ways. I know I get that. Let me help you out. Let me help you out. You've got bigger brains than the rest of us do, so let me help you here. Make the one on the left go clockwise, one on the right go counterclockwise. Can anyone do that? Now, let me give you some information here. This is really important information, and I'm not going to play games with you. The girl is not spinning. There is no inherent direction of spin in what you see on the screen. There's no clockwise or counterclockwise, because all you're seeing is a silhouette that looks exactly the same, identical from the front to the back. So when you see my arms crisscrossed like this, you can tell my right arm's in front of my left, because you can see more than the shadow. If all you saw was a silhouette of my arms, you wouldn't know which arm was in front of the other. So there is no spin here. There was only the inference of spin. So being intelligent human beings, which we all are, 
right? Change the direction of spin at will. You have all the information you need to do that. Change it. How many of you can at will, at will, consciously, not just serendipitously, change the direction of spin? It's like 10% of the room, maybe, generously. What's wrong with the rest of us? Why can't we change the direction of spin? She's not spinning, you know that. You know that. Why can't you do it? What you've established is a pattern. Once you establish a pattern, this thing up here is the greatest pattern matching engine created in the known universe. We see a pattern, we latch onto it. We don't want to change that pattern. It's a survival mechanism for us. And you could look at this for, and you still are, I can tell you're not paying attention to me right now. <laughs> you could care less. You're just, you're trying to, and you're, you're closing your eyes, you're trying to, you know, block the top or the bottom half of her, you're trying to do something, anything to convince yourself that you're actually, you know, I, I should be able to do this. This is kids' play. Do you want to guess, from a demographic standpoint, who has the easiest time of doing this? Kids. Kids. Yeah. We get wired to reinforce these patterns. And when we see it, we latch onto it. It's that lens I was talking about. That lens that says to you, hey, I'm smart, I see the pattern, I get it, and now I'm going to stick to it. And you could look at this for as long as you want, and it wouldn't change. And that is, that is ultimately, that is ultimately the challenge in building any future, is that we get stuck in these patterns of the past, and you know what? We believe in these patterns. It's not that they're bad patterns. They work for a long time. They helped us build a business, build a career, build a life, build success. And it's not this colloquial, I hate this colloquialism of, you know, getting out of the box. It's not about getting out of the box, per se. My son, he was about 12 at the time. I was trying to draw off a figure. I'm going to get this off the screen because you won't pay any attention to me whatsoever. <laughs> you can look it up on the Internet. Now, now you're going to be on your smartphones on the Internet trying to do this while I'm talking to you. I know you will. He was about 12. Adam was about 12. And, uh, and I was trying to draw a, a, a cartoonish image of someone stepping out of a box. And he was looking over my shoulder. I was at home looking over my shoulder, and he said, oh, I get what you're, what you're doing, Dad. You're trying to show someone thinking out of the box. I said, that's really cool. That's great that you get that, Adam. You know, 12 years old, I was pretty impressed. And then he, without missing a beat, he said, what do you do, Dad, if you can't get out of the box? What do you do? You know, how do you get out of the box? I thought for a second. I did what every, you know, brilliant parent does when they get that kind of a question. I, I said, I don't know, Adam. What would you do? And again, as though he had choreographed this, he didn't even, you know, take a breath. He said, I would decorate the box very nicely. <laughs> right. And isn't this what we do? This is incremental innovation, right? We decorate it nicely. We put more buttons on the thing. We put more functionality into it, more gizmos. And the more we decorate it, the better we feel about it. It's kind of what we do with our lives as well. It's not about stepping out of the box. It's when you step out of the box, what do you step into? Nothing. There's like ether, right? It's about picking the box that you want to be in. Picking that box, because we're always going to be in some kind of, there's dimensions of some sort. There's a budget, you know, there's, 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 there's debt, there's constituents, there's customers, there's, there's a, a shareholders and, and board members. There's always a box. The question is, are you in the right box at that point in time? And not are you stepping out of the box, right? Are you in the box that you need to be? And my challenge to you is that what you're seeing evolve right now is a competition generationally between these boxes, different values, a different ethos almost, around work, life, play. And you've got to make the choice, you know, which of these boxes am I going to live in? Now, I'll, I'll talk to you a bit more about that, but it's not an easy thing to do, individually or organizationally, right? Anybody ever have one of these? Yeah. You know there have been more transistor radios sold in the history of, uh, of this device than any other consumer electronics device, including, including um, iPads and, and iPods. Don't you love antennas? Whatever happened to antennas? Right? This is a, I don't know. Remember when phones used to have antennas? Remember the old StarTac used to have the antenna? I don't know. I'm stuck in the past. Um, this was the Sony first, Sony's first um, pocketable Transistor radio, pocketable because it didn't fit in the pocket, actually. Akio Morita had to have tailor-made shirts for his salespeople that had double-width pockets on them because the thing was so damn big it wouldn't actually fit into a pocket. Um, 
when Sony brought this to market, no one thought it was a good idea. I mean, everyone thought it was a ridiculous idea. It, you know, because radios weren't supposed to be portable. They were more, you know, built for people to listen to as a, as a group, as a, as a community, if, if, if you will. It's amazing when you look at the trajectory of, of Sony and the pattern that they got stuck in. The device I remember them for the most, and maybe you do as well, is, uh, is this thing. Remember this thing? Right? The Walkman. How many of these did you own? Yeah, a dozen maybe. Um, and the little headphones that were so tiny. Remember when you first put one of those, those little tiny headphones on, you thought to yourself, there's no way these are going to work. They, they can't work. They're not, you know, they don't come with a neck brace. How can they be good headphones? <laughs> and by the way, why would you want to leave your living room with headphones on? Does that make sense? And go out in, in, in traffic and be with people with headphones on? Strange behavior, right? Sony owned the industry. They literally owned the industry. They, they owned every aspect of it. Um, they owned the, the performers and the studios and, and the labels. Uh, it, it was incredible. They had such a chokehold on the industry, and yet along comes, at a point when Sony had eight distinct MP3 players, along comes this complete unknown, at least in the music industry, and creates a new box. It wasn't incremental innovation. I mean, they, they, Apple created a new box, and everyone despised it because it wasn't a new box. There was no business model for this box. It shouldn't work. And yet it did. And oddly enough, Apple didn't invent anything. Tony Fidel, I write about this in my, in my book, The Innovation Zone. Tony Fidel actually came to Apple with this device almost fully baked. Even the interface had already been created at that point in time. Apple did add some neat stuff to it. And from a design standpoint, what they did was, was pretty amazing, as is always the case with Apple. But the fundamentals, the guts of it, were already there. Didn't invent a darn thing. But they built an entirely new box. And around that box, something incredible evolved that the music industry never, ever expected. A community. This was a community building effort. If you know Apple, you know Apple's all about that. It's all about, I mean, it goes beyond community to cult in some cases, but it's all about building community. That's what iTunes is. And in fact, in fact, it is the datification of community. What do I mean by that? The datification of community. So it used to be that when we went to the market with a product, as you know, most consumer electronics firms did, they would have focus groups and they would test their product. What Apple realized was that you couldn't do that anymore. You weren't going to get the kinds of responses you needed to be able to move quickly enough to really satisfy the needs of the marketplace. And what they figured out, this is a, a chart which goes back to almost 2000, actually earlier than that, probably 1999, that, that at the time we were, we were working with Peter Drucker when I first met Drucker. And I had asked him, what's the biggest change in one of our conversations? What's the biggest change over the last 100 years? in business. He said the biggest, the biggest change is this shift from product and ownership, right, the Henry Ford model of the factory village, to this demand-driven model that is nothing but alliances, a huge supply chain of alliances, and, and a tremendously customized delivery of a product as a service. Personalization is what we call it today. That's the biggest shift that's occurred. What that shift causes us to ask is not the sky mall question, which is, you know, what can I invent today, but a more important question, which is why the hell am I inventing this to begin with? What value does this create? I would take that same question and apply it to your conversations here. What value are we creating through these efforts? And to whom? Who sees that value? Because the generational lens through which you see value is going to make a big difference in where the value actually resides and where it lies. Right? From, from what to why. And what this new generation wants more than anything else is meaning in their careers, in their companies, in their lives. Which is why, which is why, you may see over the next 10 to 20 years this mass exodus from urban to rural. These kids want meaning. They want quality. They want a different life. And you know what? They figured out that they don't have to be in any particular place other than the place they most want to be in. 
to create that value. In 10 to 20 years, I think we will see a mass shift. And we, we're barely, we're barely at the beginning of that right now. We're just realizing that we no longer have to worry about this old model of how we build businesses and build careers. Placeless, weightless, effortless. So we move from mass production and mass customization, which is the model that we've grown up with, to this notion of a complete set of unknowns. The demand chain is constantly shifting on us. The supply chain is constantly being reconfigured. And it's that upper right-hand quadrant that fascinates me. What will that look like? Going beyond mass personalization, beyond this, this service, beyond that, that Drucker four-quadrant view that I was just showing you, to that upper right-hand quadrant where everything is changing constantly. And my answer is that the only way you can deal with that rate of change, the only way that you can survive, is the way Mia and Adam currently survive, to be constantly connected to your community. It is the only means by which you can distill that information which is important to you. You can find meaning. You can engage meaningfully with others in creating value. It's a whole different world. And innovation in this world, wow. Innovation happens in a way that I think it's going to shock the daylights out of most of us. First derivative of innovation is what happens when you innovate the device. It's what we've grown up with. Right? It's all about the product, the device. Second generation takes the device and it datafies it a bit. It's what Apple did with the music industry. Then you start to add community to it and experience. iTunes, genius mixes. Beyond that, fourth derivative of innovation is where the community and the machines begin to innovate almost autonomically. I don't tell you to breathe, you just know, your body knows that it has to breathe to operate. In this world, in the fourth derivative, innovation is all about experience. And it's created entirely by the influence of the community. And this is where social media is going. By tracking behavioral patterns, by allowing us to create community, community around behavioral patterns, it allows us to innovate as a community. It changes the power structure entirely, doesn't it? It moves power. And in this future, it's all about the experience. It's all about the transparency that will exist in this world. It's, it's all about, do I trust? Is there meaning in my employment, in my community, in that network that I've created? And it becomes a super glue. I did a lot of, of, of work uh, with the folks at OnStar. You want to talk about an approach to building community that no one ever would have imagined. When they first built OnStar GM, they had no idea what they were creating. Today, today OnStar, Chet Huber, who still runs OnStar, today Chet was telling me that OnStar, if you're in an accident, it can take all the forces of the accident, the traffic patterns at the time, your behavior up until the accident, how you drive, it can incorporate all this into the local context of what's going on at that intersection, what has happened at that intersection before, what kinds of accidents have occurred. It can de determine empirically what sort of injuries you have before anyone says anything. Tell the first responders what to expect when they get there, and then make sure you get to a hospital that has the right kind of specialist there to be able to treat those kinds of empirically based injuries. That's what OnStar can do. That is the super glue of trust and transparency that ultimately creates value going forward. It is the innovation of machines and people. Let's wrap up with, with, with a couple of last thoughts here. I'm an optimist. You, you can't drive that out of me. So I don't care how big the challenge is. I believe that what we're building are communities that will be able to take on these grand challenges that we have socially, economically, politically, globally. And I think a lot of this will come from these new behaviors that these kids are going to present us with that we're already seeing. So you, you, know, you, wanna, you wanna be young, you wanna think young, you wanna be disrupted. Um, what demographic do you fall into? You know, are you a boomer? Are you a, a mature? Are you a Gen Y or a Gen Xer, a millennial, what I call Gen Zers? Um, which of these do you fall into? And you know what? The answer to that is not age. The answer to that is behavioral. Now, if you really want, if you really want to figure out how old you are, I'll give you a couple of tests that will help you to do that. Um, we talked about this one. Some of you, you know what side of that one you fell on already, so I'll give you some others. There's a great website. Anyone ever go to realage.com? Realage.com? All right, so check it out. Uh, realage.com actually allows you to figure out 
how old you are based on your behaviors, based on your behaviors, right? Um, so let me give you a couple of questions. I'll talk to you about realage.com as well, and you can try these out and kind of see what, what, what category you, you fall into. So honestly, during this presentation, how many of you checked your email or your text while I was presenting? Come on, raise the hands. Every single person in the damn room. Isn't that wild? <laughs> yeah, I did too. Don't feel badly. I was as well. You, you think I'm... And I got two calls, by the way, while I was up here as well. Um, so you go to realage.com, and, and the, it's a great site, but be careful. You're, you're been forewarned, okay? It, it first says, you know, what are, what are your habits? You know, do you work out? What do you eat? And, you know, you enter in, be honest, you enter in what your habits are. And then it says, you know, what kind of over-the-counter meds and supplements do you take? That's pretty okay. You know, I'll tell it what I take for supplements and vitamins. And, and then it says, you know, what kind of prescription drugs do you take? Oh, okay, you know, I really want to know how old I am. So I keep on, you know, typing away. It's not got a medical history of me, right? Um, it gets into what kinds of illnesses have you had, surgeries, so on and so forth. And, and then finally, after 45 minutes of doing this, I realize, holy cow, this thing knows more about me now than my primary care physician does. <laughs> and there was one question, there was one question that kind of drove me over the edge, where I finally said, that's it, I've had enough. And I was at this point, I'm 55, I was 47 according to realage.com. But I wanted to get it lower, right? I wanted to get it lower. I was driving towards 27, that was my goal. Um, <laughs> And then it got to this question where it asked, how many times a week do you make whoopee? Yeah, my first thought was, weekly? Seriously? <clears throat> I'm sharing way too much, I know, I know. Um, and then it hit me, there's no delete button. Uh, that's, I can't undo this. Um, now I'm suddenly, I'm, you know, realage.com owns my entire medical history. I'd have to get them on the phone and have them, you know, purge my records somehow, and God knows where this is going to end up at some point in time. We're all getting more and more transparent, and we're just kind of doing it. You know, we're not thinking about it. We're just doing it. We're being tracked like wildlife with these, with these smart devices that know more about us than we know about ourselves and our behaviors. And the, the most valuable product in the future it's not gold, precious metals. The most valuable product in the future is what? Better than data and information. It's you. What's your name? Lucas. Lucas is the most valuable product going forward. It's his behaviors. My understanding of Lucas and what he does, that's what I want. That's what Google's striving for. That's what Facebook's striving for. That's what Apple wants. You're the product. If I own you, it's not just the data, it's the behavior. God knows what I can do with that. But Lucas is asking the same question I'm asking is, well, do I get a piece of that? It's my, it's my behavior. Don't I own some of that? Not yet. Not yet. Um, answer truthfully. How many of you, before you even got out of bed, yeah, you're chuckling, but I'm going to hold your feet to the fire. Before you even got out of bed this morning, before you even got out of bed, put one foot on the floor, checked email or your text messages. Raise your hands. Isn't that wild? How many of you in the first 30 minutes after you woke up checked email or texts? Everyone, again. Is that aberrant behavior? Is that weird, right? Is that like my daughter who sleeps with her laptop on, you know, on the pillow next to her? Right? I got this great app on, on my phone that actually, ask, ask your kid, ask your kid if they know what it means to dial, if you have a, a young kid, you know, anyone under the age of, of 20, basically. But my kids love this app. They get to dial on the phone. My son actually used, um, he, he loves this app. He, he used it. I've got this problem in my household, which is that um, all the cordless phones always disappear, that, you know, the, the ones in the, the handsets that roam around the house. So I don't know if you've got one of these devices yet. I love these things. My son gets such a kick out of this. Do you have one of these yet? <laughs> this feels so intimate and so comfortable as compared to this. So my son, my son loves it when I use this. He gives me a lot of grief. But one day, when I first got this, I'm using it, and I'm talking to someone on the phone. And when I got off, he said, Dad, you know how you're always screaming at us to put the handsets back in the holders because they get shoved under the couch cushions and what have you and, you know, dragged off by the dog? He said, he said you know how you're always screaming at us to, to put them back? What if someone, what if someone put a, a cord on the handset just like that and attached it to the, to the phone base? I said, you go with that. You... That could pay for your college education right there. 
He had never seen this. He had no idea. Remember how long these cords were, right? They get all tangled up, and you'd have to hold the phone like this to make it, you know, twirl around. And, um, I've got a better one, by the way, if you want really cool. And this does plug into my iPhone. I'm not kidding. I'm not making this stuff up. This plugs in, and check this out, if you want. Is that cool? No, okay. It's the reaction I get from my son. Um, it is behavior that defines ultimately, ultimately, which of these groups you belong to. That, that is the demographic. It's not comfortable. It's not supposed to be. It's not supposed to be comfortable. And, and my point to you is don't discount what these kids are doing as just having too much time on their hands. This is the way they are going to learn to live, to work, and to play. It's not a solo fight for them. They won't do it alone. They can't do it alone. They don't know how to do it alone. They don't want to do it alone. They despise being alone. They're scared to death of being alone. We can argue that. We can argue the splendor of solitude. It is the way that they are. It is how they've grown up. I kept my kids away from technology the first five, six, seven years of their lives as best I could because I wanted them to develop social skills first. But once they got the, the drug, you know, that's it, they were hooked. And my son, my son spends hours gaming on a daily basis. But what he's building is something incredible. If you look at the history of the Nobel Prize in the last century, the first half of the last century, it was almost exclusively awarded to individuals, not the teams. Second half of the last century, pretty evenly awarded to individuals and teams. In the next 50 years, my premise is that we won't see Nobels given to individuals anymore. It'll just be the teams. These kids only know how to collaborate. You know, for them, it's not, this is not a trend. It is a way of life. It is the way they play, and this is the way they'll work. I played like this, a stack of Legos. My son goes onto legofactory.com. He doesn't play like this. For him, it's a social activity. You know, he'll use what's the equivalent of a CAD CAM system, basically, to create his Lego toys. He'll have them packaged, and, and he can customize the packaging, have them shipped to the, to the house. But what's cool for him is doing this with his friends, and it's not Adam's toy. The community built it. They built it as a community. It's not Adam's thing anymore. He doesn't care who owns it. They're doing it together. It's social. They never game alone. They're always gaming together, and without regard to boundaries whatsoever. And, and I, as a parent, I don't know what's right. Four hours a day, eight hours a day, 24 hours a day. You know, Adam will go 25 if I let him. <laughs> and we have these raging debates. Oh, I love this kid, but my God, he drives me crazy. Uh, during the summer, this last summer, he had, well, was on these nonstop gaming marathons at one point. It, this is bad parental advice. I'm just you know, putting that out there, okay? And I just really got, I had it with him. I had it. I had it. I said, Adam, just get out of the house. Go out, you know, play in the cul-de-sac. Do something, please. Get out, get some vitamin D. And, and, and he, he looked at me, and he said, no. He said, I'm, 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 my friends are here, Dad. You know, leave me alone. My friends are here. I, I said, Adam, you get off the damn computer. Go watch some TV. Do something, you know, for God's sake. <laughs> He said, Dad, no, you don't get it. My friends are here. I said, Dad, go. You know, I, said, I said, Adam, go out with your friends in the cul-de-sac. And then he lost it. He completely lost it. He pointed at the computer, and he said, Dad, this is my cul-de-sac. Wow. What do you say to that? I said, get the hell out and get some vitamin D. I, how, do you, how do you respond to that? This is my cul-de-sac. That is where his friends are. Th this is where... He socializes. He's building skills that, you know, I can't claim to really understand fully. I can observe them. I can speculate. But I can't feel them through his eyes, through his brain. And these kids are going to work and work and work. Because to them, work will just be part of life. They'll always be connected to some network through which they can work. For a lot of us, the same is true, perhaps, right? I mean, a lot of us can keep working. Um, retirement has changed in meaning, at least, uh, if not disappeared altogether. But you know what's extraordinary? I play with these numbers sometimes, and I get a kick out of the trend lines. We're all, we continue to be living longer. It may be more in maintenance mode, but we continue to be living longer. At the same time, we're working longer. And if you plot work life expectancy against life expectancy, look at what happens. What do you think this is illustrating? Why is it so funny? Because you're going to be working after you're dead. You think that's cute? You know what? You can actually, today, buy apps that will keep posting on your Facebook and your Twitter account after you're gone. How many of you have dead friends on Facebook? 
So I put up my Facebook page a few weeks ago. There's Luna waiting for a ride in the car. Three of those friends are dead. They still come up. I still grow their websites. I wonder sometimes, could like one dead friend post another dead friend's wall? Is that possible? It's weird. It's awkward. But this, this is the kind of behavior that we're creating. And it's strange beyond what we can illustrate here. And it gets so much stranger. Uh, anyone seen the space shuttle take off? They're no longer taking off. Anyone ever see the space shuttle take off? My big regret in life, isn't it incredible? It's, it's such a visceral experience. Your whole body kind of feels it. You smell it, you feel it, you know, you hear it. Um, my, my only real regret in life, I tend to be a pretty content person by and large, was not having become an astronaut. I, I just, as a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut. That was, that was my, my ambition. I, I didn't have the math skills or anything else to kind of get me there, but that was where I wanted to go. So a friend of mine and, and a team from a Wisconsin based uh, TV network were doing a documentary on the last space shuttle, STS-135. And they invited me to come along. And it was a, it was a really wonderful gesture on, on their part. My mom had just passed away. I, just, I needed to, to get somewhere and get out of myself. And, and uh, my friend Mike said, Tom, why don't you come down? We'll even give you a camera. You can be part of the camera crew. And you can interview some of the astronauts. I said, wow, really? It's like a little kid. Absolutely, I'd love to come down. I, I I've never seen a rocket take off, much less the space shuttle. So they invited me. I went down. And it went off without a hitch. You're going to see a little piece of the trailer for the documentary here. Um, we can bring down the volume on, on this. We don't need a lot of volume. And, and um, as, I was, as I was watching this, they had me right there where the press are, as close as you can get to the launch, you know, they, they, as you can if you're not an astronaut. And I, I saw the whole thing. Magnificent, magnificent. I mean, I, I was just so out of my mind to be there. And so, of course, you know, I, I recorded the thing, but I wanted to record it on my, on my iPhone as well. So, you know, as the shuttle is taking off, I've got the iPhone there and I'm waiting for the countdown. And it actually, it actually went off on time. It actually went off on time. So I was there poised, and, and you're going to see a little piece of video footage that I actually took with my iPhone that ended up in the documentary. It's this little piece of footage right here. So I'm sitting there, I'm looking at this thing. Oh, my whole life I've wanted to be here. And I'm recording it, and I'm looking at it as it's going up, and it's going up into the clouds, and, and the flame is coming out of the back of it, and I'm trying to not lose sight of it, and then eventually it's gone, and I realize, oh my God, I just missed it. I saw the whole thing on, on this little two by three inch screen, and I was right there. All I had to do was get this out of the way. But I didn't. I didn't. I'll never see one again. I mean, do you feel badly? I, I, I'm ready to shed a tear right now just thinking about this. We get sucked into this stuff. As leaders, which you all are, you gotta walk a fine line. You have to allow the disruption to enter the organization, to enter people's lives. But you also, you also have to make sure that you create a balance. There is a human element to what we're talking about. Community is always about the human beings. It's always about the human beings. Remember this clip from the uh, Titanic? It's when they finally see the iceberg. And everything we talk about comes into play here. Yes, what you see. Iceberg, right They couldn't have predicted it. Not exactly where it would be. They couldn't have predicted the, the weather patterns. They couldn't have predicted the, the problems in the manufacture of the ship. But you know what? They still, they still did everything right by the book based on past behaviors. The problem with the Titanic was it was so large, it had three screws, three, three shafts and three screws, three propellers. And right there, when the chief engineer reversed the engines, they put all three screws into reverse wrong thing to do. I mean, they, they actually had enough time to pivot around the iceberg. They could have done that if they had pivoted rather than just put the thing into full astern. But, but they didn't. They didn't. The uncertainty principle we talked about, smaller windows, all of that comes to beer. But you know what? Don't worry about any of this. Don't worry about any of this. As leaders, here's what I want you to remember. See the look in the eyes of the first officer? Why isn't she turning? If you ever see this look in the eyes of leadership in your organization, Get the hell off the boat. <laughs> That's it. Got it? So who said this? Who said this? Who said everything that can be invented has been invented? Who was so supremely arrogant, 
So uninformed and ill-advised is to be able to say this. Commissioner of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, 1899. We don't believe it, but we behave it. What you're building is the future. Allow the disruption to enter your lives and your organizations. As leaders understand that believing it is not enough. You have to behave it. And these behaviors will take us all, all, by surprise. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to have some fun after lunch, by the way, so you haven't seen the end of me. We're going to have a great time after lunch. Do we have time for questions? I think we've run over. We're right up pretty much on the mark. Two questions? Absolutely. So we have time for two questions. Whatever, whatever is uh, on your mind, um, I'd love to, uh, and I can't see all that well from up here, so there are, I know there are two microphones right there, but we can also bring the mics to you if needed, I believe. Tom. Mark, is that you? I can't, I can't yes, see. Yes, it is. It's, it's me. Um, you know, in, in going back over everything that you said, I mean, you talked about us building patterns so you can only see the person turn one way, which I, unfortunately, was one of. But you all, but you, and then you talked about the kids were really good at that. So we're, we're trying to work with communities to get them to be comfortable with change and adapt to change, and in a, in a very kind of silly way of stating it, what age kids should we have as leaders of our community? That's a great, that, that's, that's a wonderful um, question. Thank you so much for asking that. So a couple of observations there. First of all, uh, you should all have in your communities reverse mentors. These are kids who will actually reverse mentor on these behaviors. Their role is to be there to help you understand why Twitter, why Facebook, why Pinterest, what's the point, what's the value, what's the reason, all right? Reverse mentoring, I barely see it. There are a few companies I've been involved with that, that do it and do it well. Cisco is one of them. Um, it is irritating. For the gray hairs or the no hairs or whatever, uh, it, it's, it's, not, it's not pleasant. I mean, I've seen folks literally get, you know, just upset at the, uh, at the reverse mentoring. But you need that disruption. So the, the first thing I would say is make sure you have reverse mentors in those community groups. The second was age. Your question was about age. Um, you know, it's, it's fascinating to me, there are certain breakpoints where, where kids begin to change their behavior when it comes to how they approach problem solving and how they take on challenges. The first breakpoint is pretty much somewhere in the age of between five and seven, where they start to realize there are certain answers that are right and certain answers that are wrong. Before that age, they don't track their failures. After that age, they track their failures. Uh, so there's, there's a magic to having those young minds. Some kids, however, are, are able to preserve that ability to be disruptive as they grow older. And part of it is identifying those kids who can preserve that. The right age to begin, I, anywhere from 14 on. Um, I want to know what they're feeling at that age. I want to know why their experience is so different. Uh, and I think if you empower them by telling them, look, we want you here because we want you to tell us those things that we don't know. Don't, don't expect that we have answers to the questions that we're asking, because we don't. Only you have the answers to these questions. If you give them that empowerment, it's amazing what you can get out of them. Um, it's not a matter of them informing you on something that you're already doing. It's a matter of them informing you on something which you don't even know how to approach doing. So I think any, any from 14 on is, is, my, is my suggestion. But use reverse mentoring. And empower these kids. Some of them will, will take that. Um, as, a, as a tremendous challenge, and, and, and they'll want to, uh, to be part of it um, if you empower them in the, right, in the right way. Do we have another question before we break? I don't want to... I have a question. Yes. Hi, Mary Jane Trumper, Omaha, Hi, Nebraska. Mary Jane. Hi. Um, we have many communities in the nation, and Omaha right now is going through a process where we're trying to envision Heartland 2050 and what our community is going to look like as far as zoning, where people are going to live, what needs to be parks, uh, agriculture. Is this an exercise in futility? Can, I mean, do we know? To look that far out, you mean? Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's so much will change between now and 2050. Was that the, 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 the year you gave? Yes. Well, I, I think it's always good to have a long view. I think it's always good to have a sense of, of, of what's called popularly the, the, the long now. You need that. You need a compass setting. At the same time, when you come face to face with reality, you've got to realize that you've got to take a detour, that you may have made investment in infrastructure or approach, technology, even a form of community uh, that isn't going to work any longer. So you have to accept that that's part of the risk you take in, in doing that. Look, one of the things I didn't talk about, which this, these next generations are, are much more forgiving of, 
is failure. So you ask that question in, in terms of, if we build this grand plan and we fail, haven't we done a bad thing? And my answer would be no. No, you've failed in parts of it. You haven't failed in, in its entirety. There are parts of it that are going to fail. That's part of the risk in doing any sort of planning. Accept that risk. And, and these generations are more tolerant of that. They, they, they do embrace failure. My grad students, my grad students, God bless them, if they haven't had two or three startup failures by the time they get out of graduate school, they feel that they're a failure. So they, they've inverted the whole idea of what it means to fail. So the risk is always going to be there. You need to have some compass, um, some thing to align the community about, but you also have to be willing to let go of pieces of it as they become outdated, which they absolutely will, which they absolutely will. Not in, 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 you know, in 40 years, but in five years or six years or seven years. Yeah. And keep adjusting that plan. Keep adjusting that plan. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm looking forward to after lunch as well. Thank you. Thank you.